Good morning. Let's try to settle down. First of all, thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, some people actually had to leave us yesterday, so we're a little bit of a smaller group, but thank you for being the ones that you know stuck it out till the end, and hopefully you'll be here through our wonderful next set of workshops and also the clothing plenary. So today, for this work, for this particular plenary, we wanted to focus on trying to think about the future and how we need to work on transforming and evolving our healthcare system so that it meets the needs of the future of America. And we're very lucky today to have two people who are going to first talk to us a little bit about what are the ch demographic changes that are going to be occurring, that are in the midst of occurring right now, uh, in the United States of America, and then we're going to have someone comment on how those changes are going to affect the healthcare system and give us some ideas about the work that needs to be done to make sure that the healthcare system that we have in the future really serves everybody in the United States of America. So, first of all, let me introduce we have Paul Taylor, who is a senior fellow at the Pew Research Center. Prior to that, he was the executive vice president where he oversaw demographic, social, and generational research. He has authored several books, including The Next America, Boomers, Millenni Millennials, and The Looming Generational Showdown, See How They Run, and he co-authored The Old News versus The New News. Prior to working at Pew, he was president and board chairman of the Alliance for Better Campaigns, and that was after being a journalist for 25 years. During his 14 years at the Washington Post, he covered national politics and he was their bureau chief in South Africa during the transformation from apartheid to democracy. Paul Taylor is a Yaley who has been visiting, uh, visiting professor at Princeton University twice. And next to him we have Brian Smedley, who is the co-founder and executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity, a brand new project that connects research, policy analysis, and communications with the on-the-ground activism to advance health equity. The National Collaborative seeks to improve opportunities for good health for people of color and to undo the health consequences of racism. Dr. Smedley is lauded as a national thought leader on health equity, well known for having edited the Institute of Medicine's groundbreaking report, Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare, in addition to in the nation's compelling interest, ensuring diversity in the healthcare workforce. Prior to launching the National Collaborative, Dr. Smedley led the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies Health Policy Institute. He co-founded the Opportunity Agenda, and he also worked at the Institute of Medicine and directed public interest policy for the American Psychological Association. Dr. Smedley has received several awards for his health justice work, including the, the American Public Health Association's Cornelia Award for Social Activism, the Congressional Black Caucus's Congressional Leadership in Advocacy, and Healthcare Hero Awards, and the Health Trailblazer Award from the Rainbow Push Coalition. He's a graduate of Harvard and UCLA. So please welcome Mr. Paul Taylor, who's gonna start us off. Thank you, I am delighted to be here. Um, I, it's my job to, uh, I'm not going to utter the word health policy, I think, in the 15 or 20 minutes that I speak. I'm the guy uh, with the view from 30,000 feet. Brian will uh, bring it back home to mo the more specific interests of this panel. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about demographic change. And demographic change is a drama in slow motion. It unfolds tick by tock, incrementally, but it uh, transform societies in profound ways, and the America of the early 21st century is undergoing two such dramas at the same time. We are en route to becoming a majority non-white country, at the same time a record share of us, like me, are going gray. Uh, either of these would be the transforming demographic story of, of its era. The fact that they're happening on top of each other has created generation gaps. We, we are in a world now where young and old don't look alike, don't think alike, and don't vote alike. And this has the potential to put stress on everything from our politics to our pocketbooks to, uh, to our social safety net uh, to our whole sense of social cohesion. 
The paradox, however, uh, of this sort of change is that even though it happens all around us, it's sometimes hard to see. An old editor of mine described the, these stories as stories that ooze rather than break. Nobody calls a press conference to announce uh, that the meaning of race is changing, that the architecture of our families is different, that the arc of economic well-being has migrated north on the, in, on the age cycle. But every so often, we, societies have what I call aha moments, where the scales lift from our eyes and you do see it. And I want to open my presentation with what I think was the most powerful aha moment of 2014. It happened to have happened at the Super Bowl, which is on our minds these days. We all know that in modern culture, the Super Bowl has become, among other things, the Super Bowl of advertising, and all the big brands roll out their new messages. Somebody my age has been watching TV ads for more than 50 years, and I kind of know what a TV ad family is supposed to look like. And among other things, the rules have been that the parents in a TV ad family are supposed to be uh, the same race and the opposite sex. That's just the way it has gone. Now let's take a look at three, I'm just going to show you six or eight second clips of three ads that ran a year ago at the Super Bowl. We're going to start with Chevy, then Cheerios, then Coke. While what it means to be a family hasn't changed, what a family looks like has. This is the new us. That was Chevy. Uh, here's Cheerios. You know how our family has daddy and mommy? And me. Yeah, that's right. Pretty soon, you're going to have a baby brother. She's not too pleased about that. <laughs> And here's Coke. So listen, uh, product advertisers are not in the business of making political statements. They're certainly not in the business of making political enemies, not when each of them is spending four million dollars for 30 seconds in front of the biggest audience we assemble every year. And surely they knew if they changed the rules, if, if, if the parents were now the opposite race and the same sex, and if we're singing America the Beautiful in six different languages, you're going to get some blowback, and indeed some blowback came. It came in the uh, precincts of the conservative bloggosphere and, and some of the conservative uh, cable stations, et cetera. If you, those of you who remember this know that actually that Cheerios ad with the interracial couple, that was the second version of that. Their, the comment stream on YouTube had gotten so ugly in the first version, they had to pull it down for a while. But they went back and said, mm -mm, we're in it for real. So you know, listen, they focus group these things to death. They do their research, and they decided, no, we're going to get blowback, but this is worth it. Now, what did they know? What does their research tell them? So here's what they know. So we're looking now at, at a chart of America, the racial makeup of our, our population in, eight, in 1960, where we're at 80, our population is 85% white. And this is where we're heading, according to the Census Bureau, by 2060, where we'll be 44% white. And we go from almost a monolithic country, a monochromatic country, if you will, to a rainbow country. What is driving this change? What's driving this change is the modern immigration wave, which begins in this country in 1965, when we pass legislation opening our borders back up, having closed them for about 30 or 40 years in response to earlier immigration waves. Immigration waves always produce political and social and economic backlashes, uh, but this one uh, begins when we decide to open it back up, and we've since had, actually, we're up to 43 million immigrants in the nearly 50 years since we opened our borders back up. This is actually the third uh, great immigration wave in our nation's history. The first begins in the middle of the 19th century. It's Northern and Western Europe. It's Germans. It's Irish. It's the leading groups. Uh, then uh, the, the countries, the regions of origin migrate uh, in Europe, South and East. So it's Italians, it's Poles, Russians, Jews, etc. You add up all the immigrants who came in those two waves, which span about 80 years, and you have 32 million immigrants. Today's wave, which is now uh, nearly 50 years, 43 million and counting. So in absolute numbers, it's bigger than the first two combined, although as a share of the population, uh, is, wasn't, isn't quite as big. Uh, but the other big change, of course, about the modern wave is, is the regions of origin. So we were 9 and 10 from Europe uh, through the, uh, you know, a century ago. Now 
we have ha just 12% 12 from Europe, half of our modern immigrants from Latin America, nearly three in 10 from Asia. If you just look at the last five years, Asian immigration has surpassed uh, Latino immigration, and that is likely to continue given the dynamics of the, of the sending region. Immigrants are strivers. Immigrants uh, believe in the future, they bet on the future, uh, and they want a better future for their children. So while the, the regions of origin may be different, something else is not different. Immigrants tend to have a lot of kids. That's, that's part of the exercise. Uh, so there's a phrase that demographers use called immigrant stock, which describes the share of the uh, population at a given time that's either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And again, if you go back to 1960, about one in five Americans were immigrant stock. But if you project forward, and listen, these are projections, they may be off by a, a few percentage points, but one thing about demography, unlike political pro uh, prognostication, demography is sort of the future we already know. A lot of this is baked in and it's not gonna move all that much. And we're heading to a record share uh, by the middle of this century, nearly 37% uh, of Americans. Uh, based on current trends will be immigrants or the children of immigrants. But you know what, if you go back in time, what you begin to realize is this is not, you know, for a lot of us, the middle of the last century is sort of the starting point, and that was the traditional America. What this uh, reminds us is we have always been a nation of immigrants, and we have always been enormously well served by immigrants, and what we are doing in effect is going back to the patterns that were familiar in this country a um, uh, hundred years ago. Here are a couple of numbers that reflect how important immigrants are going forward to the vitality of our economy. Uh, 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 three quarters of the growth uh, in our workforce this decade is accounted for by Hispanics coming in, and it's Hispanics coming in, and it's basically older whites going out. And again, immigrants and their children between now and the middle of the century account for basically all, 90% of the growth uh, of our labor force. So, they are very important, as they have always been, to the vitality of our economy. 40% uh, of the Fortune 500 companies uh, have, you know, were started uh, by immigrants or their children. Uh, their manpower, their brain power, has been a source of strength and is likely to continue. Obviously, we have a huge debate over illegal immigration. We have figured out how to resolve that. Uh, about a quarter of the modern immigrants are here illegally. But that policy debate uh, shouldn't obscure this larger truth. Uh, that the strength of this country rests with immigrants as it always has. So let's now return to this rainbow that we lo look like we're heading towards uh, in 2060 and ask another interesting question. Do these familiar categories, we are a country that has been defining people and dividing people and slicing and dicing people by race and ethnicity since, since before we became a country, right? But do these old categories, uh, what kind of job are they doing in keeping up with our new marriages? Because something else interesting is going on. If you go back uh, to 1960, or actually we'll start in 1961, when Barack Obama's parents were married and Barack Obama was born, and just let's not start a political argument, let's stipulate that uh, those events happened in Hawaii rather than Kenya. Uh, <laughs> our, best, our best guess is that something on the order of magnitude of one-tenth of one percent of all marriages that year was like that marriage between a black person and a white person. It was still illegal in 16 states. It's fair to say it was a gasp-inducing taboo throughout the entire country. And then if you look at all marriages that year, across all lines of race and ethnicity, about two and a half percent were interracial or interethnic. And then carry this line forward, uh, and here we are today, uh, about 15 or 16 percent of all marriages are across uh, these boundaries, these lines. This again is a pattern led by our new immigrants, so more than a quarter of all Asians and Hispanics who, quote, marry out uh, are marrying non-Asians, non-Hispanics, uh, as do 17 percent of blacks uh, and uh, 9 percent of whites. There are some interesting gender patterns here among blacks who marry out. Uh, the men are nearly three times more likely than women to do so. Among Asians, it goes the other way. The women are more than twice as likely as the men to do so. Do so. Those of you who read your New York Times, uh, your Washington Post this morning, read a really uh, fun feature, front page feature on the new governor of Maryland, who was just sworn in this week. He's unusual because he's a Republican in a very blue state. He's unique because he is a uh, he is a white man. Uh, whose wife, the new first lady of Maryland, is a Korean American. And it's a kind of a nice story about how they found each other. And that's, that's not that unusual a story anymore. 
Uh, whites uh, marry out at lower rates, uh, as you can see, than other groups, but they are still the largest single racial group. So 70% of all modern uh, interracial and interethnic marriages involve a white spouse. So here's an interesting question. What are we going to call, what are we going to call the children of these marriages? What are the children of these marriages going to call themselves? Do these, do these racial categories, as we go forward and uh, we have an ever-growing mixed race population, do they really, uh, do they make sense anymore? This is actually one of the, one of the interesting social challenges that we face. You know, and the answer is nowadays we're not even sure what to call the President of the United States. So about a year after Barack Obama was elected, the Pew Research Center did a national survey and we asked the public, what do you think? Do you think of Barack Obama mainly as a, as a black person or mainly as a mixed race person? And you see the results. A slight majority of whites said mainly mixed race, a slight majority of blacks said mainly black, but significant minorities of each group sort of had it the other way, indicating that our very vocabulary is in a moment of flux, uh, struggling to keep up with these new behaviors. Barack Obama himself, uh, sometimes calls himself a mutt, uh, and he had, he had the opportunity, as we all did in 2010, uh, on, on the census form to say who he was, and our census form since 1970 uh, has allowed people to declare who they are. Prior to that, we had census takers doing that. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I spent three years in South Africa during the transition from apartheid to democracy. There's a country that had taken racial categorization to pathological extremes, and the census takers there used something known as the pencil test. So a person would come in and to test the kinkiness of the person's hair, a pencil would be inserted in the person's head, and if the pencil stuck straight up, that person was black or African. If the pencil tilted, that person was colored, a different racial categorization that had different sets of, of, of rights and privileges. We don't, we don't, we don't, what we do here is let people say who they are, and Barack Obama could have said he's black, he could have said he's white, he could have said he's both black and white. And he chose black, and he actually got some blowback from the growing mixed race community in this country who said, hey, why don't you, why don't you assert all of your bloodlines, if you will? And his response in so many words was, hey, take a look at me. My name is Barack Hussein Obama. I grew up in the America of the late 20th century. Who, who are we kidding? I grew up as a black man, and that's who I am. And I think, I think most people get that. But here's, here's an interesting uh, gallery of pretty good A-list celebrities, right? They are all mixed race. For some of them, being mixed race is a part of their cultural identity. For some, it's completely incidental. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, most mixed race people uh, don't lead these sorts of glamorous lives. But who we, quote, elect as our celebrities does say something about who we are. It suggests that some of the stigma, through most of human history, being mixed race has been a stigma, and it is often the case in most cultures. You find yourself rejected from both of the mainstream uh, ra racial groups. Uh, this suggests that that stigma is receding. I think that's going to continue. Uh, the median age of a white person in this country is 42. The median age of a black person, I think, is about 37. Hispanic, about 28. A mixed race person, 19. This is, this is a, a place that we are going uh, but I want to end this with, uh, this is a little bit hard to see, I, I, I don't want to suggest that because of this, and I think there's a lot that's very attractive about this change, and particularly about the attitudes of younger adults toward this change, which is, of course this is who we are, you know, the, the, what's the big deal? Um, uh, but there was a lot of commentary after Obama was first elected where people, particularly blacks, but frankly everybody said, boy, didn't see that coming. You know, we didn't see that was going to happen in, in, in our lifetimes. Are we heading to, in a post -race, to a post-racial society where race doesn't matter? I think the answer, <laughs> as we have been re reminded in the last six months in Ferguson and Staten Island, et cetera, is no. Race is very complicated. It's some way it's our original sin. It, it, it won't go away. It hasn't gone away. Here's an, here's an interesting chart where Gallup asks for the last, what, seven to 60 or 70 years, what's the most important uh, problem in the country today. And you see, we're reminded with MLK uh, Week and, and the movie Selma, you see back in the 60s when the civil rights issues were front and center, we had a majority of people in the country saying race relations is the biggest issue in the country. Basically, that, that disappears and it falls down to low single digits with the exception of a few little blips. That one in the 1990s was Rodney King and the LA riots. And then now, it, just in the last six months, uh, as we've been reminded, uh, that there are huge 
perception and, and experiential differences between black and whites across a lot of realms, but at the top of the differences is attitudes about and experiences with the criminal justice system. And that is playing out and it's, 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 it's one of the challenges we continue to face. Okay, um, uh, our next big change, getting older, and l l let me set that up with another TV ad that I suspect uh, will be familiar to most of us here. Ameriprise asked people a simple question. In retirement, will you outlive your money? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second, but let's take, let's take a look uh, at something that demographers call an age pyramid. Uh, and this is, uh, every horizontal bar represents a five-year slice of the population. So the, the zero to fours are at the bottom, the 85 and overs are at the top, okay? And whenever demographers slice and dice any given population in this way, you always get a pyramid. This was our pyramid in 1960. Uh, you go back to 1850, it's still a pyramid now. The, the, the angles are much steeper, right? Because fewer people live to middle age and old age, but it's still a pyramid. Uh, here we are now in 1900. The angles are shifting a little bit. Here we are back in 1960. And again, let's take a look and see what happens to our pyramid in the next 100 years. So we've got ourselves a rectangle, and, and uh, this, is, this is uncharted waters in human history. Um, you can actually bring our rectangle to a pyramid, but you basically have to do is sort of expand the boundaries, and you, you now have to, uh, we now have something that looks a little bit like the, uh, the, the top of the Washington Monument, right? So we've got the 85 to 89s, et cetera, et cetera. The uh, Census Bureau says by middle of this uh, century, we will have about a half a million people age 100 and over. Um, there's a lot to like about this change. There are challenges, which I'll talk about and end my presentation with in a minute, but there's a lot to like about this profound demographic shift, which is happening all over the country. Um, it is the product of two enormously important changes that have been happening all over the world. Uh, one of them is the increase in life expectancy. Uh, we, uh, life expectancy at birth, just 100 years ago, was 49. Uh, we're up to 79. With, by the middle of the century, we should be around 85. And there are some people who think we ain't seen nothing yet. There are scientists at work around the world on whether it's Methuselah drugs or whether it's computer trips who believe that actually you can just keep the body going like a vintage car. You just need a good mechanic. We're going to find it. We're going to get it. This is a, this is a, a, a little bit of a kind of mind-blowing prospect to a lot of people. Woody Allen has a line about this. He says, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality by not dying. And, and, and while uh, there are some people who think that's not a preposterous notion, we did a survey uh, last year where we asked the American public, if you could live to be 120 in reasonably good health, would you want to and would you think most other people would want to? And again, reflecting the, the, the confusion and attitudes on this, because it is sort of hard to think about, a majority of people said, no, I don't want to, but a majority of people said, yes, but most other people would want to. So I, I think as we think, about, as we think about what life is and, and what the arc of relationships are and what some of the financial challenges of, of older folks reflect, this is something in our future. So the other side of this, but, but at, at the bottom line is, if you believe life is good, and I think most of us do, what's not to like about uh, increased longevity? Similarly, if you worry about the sustainability of the Earth and you worry about overpopulation, as demographers have since the days of Malthus, uh, the decline in fertility rates is an almost uniformly good thing. And I'm just showing the decline in our country since 1900. If you went back to 18 or 1700, the average woman would have been at five or six. You got a lot of, this is happening all over the world. It's happening at different paces and in, in different places, but there's almost no country that isn't experiencing a sharp decline, uh, so much so in Western Europe and Eastern Asia that they're looking at uh, huge population declines. But in countries as disparate as uh, Iran and Mexico, just in the last 50 years, uh, birth rates uh, have gone from about six per woman down to two per woman. So uh, now, What's interesting, one of the things interesting about our line is it's been a straight s a shot, but look at that little bump in the middle. That's called the baby boom. Uh, and that is, 
part of the challenge we face because we are looking at, uh, but before we get to that, l l let me just show you uh, where some other major economies around the world will be in 2060 with their age pyramids. And uh, they are not only rectangles, they are, they are sort of upside, uh, top heavy trapezoids. So here's China, which has more old than young by the middle of this century. China had, has had the one child policy for many years and this is sort of the, fr the fruits of that. Here's Germany. Uh, Germany, in Germany, uh, deaths have exceeded births every year for the last 40 years. Uh, and, uh, same is happening in, in, uh, in Russia, which has begun depopulating and may, uh, may have more depopulation of any great country since the bubonic plague, if current trends continue. And here's Japan, which is sort of the global leader, uh, both in longevity and in low birth rates. In Japan, the birth rate is something like right, 1.3, 1.4. There's simply fewer young people coming into the economy to help support more old people. This is a global challenge, and actually if you do the comparison with the U.S. Uh, and the rest of the, the world's leading economies, we have the most enviable demographics on this. So Japan <coughs> will have an astonishing median age of 53 by the middle of this century. Germany not far behind at 52, uh, China at around 47. The U.S. at 41, we're at 37 now. So we're getting older, but the rest of the world's leading economies are getting older faster and are facing these challenges. Uh, just to conclude now, uh, the fact that we have the most enviable demographics on this doesn't mean we don't have problems. And the problems we have are exacerbated by that bulge, that baby boom bulge, which begins right after World War II. Uh, the GIs come home, we won the war, everything is great, let's make babies. And, and uh, for 18 or 20 years, the birth rates in this country shot up to about three per woman and stayed there. They actually came down uh, almost as dramatically as they came up uh, in the mid-60s, and that was with the, with the introduction of the birth control pill. But during that period, we had a record number of people born, and it's been a pig and a python generation all the way through. So they had a lot, and I'm one of them, and they had to build a lot of schools for us, and we built a lot of suburbs and all the rest. And in, in the 60s, as we came of age, there was a lot of countercultural protests, and the old people have screwed everything up. We're here to make it, make it all right. Um, but where are the baby boomers today? Well, today, 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 and retire. Uh, tomorrow, another 10,000 will, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And this will happen every single day between now and the year 2030. And by the time this whole pig and a python generation crosses the line from being workers and, uh, and taxpayers to being retirees, uh, our great social safety net will no longer work. And, and let, me, let me end with just a few lines here because this really is the policy challenge here. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the reasons that Social Security in particular, but Social Security and Medicare have been so enormously popular is that as they were, uh, as they were created, this year is the 80th uh, anniversary, by the way, of Social Security, created in the midst of the Great Depression, created by a president who understood if they were seen as the old dole, as he described them, they would not be politically popular. But if you created them and, and, and presented them as an earned benefit program, you pay your taxes while you're working, government holds the money, you get it back when you retire, uh, that would give it a basis for political support. And in that sense, it is summa cum laude. It has been magnificently successful in retaining political support because people don't see it as a poverty program. Uh, the finances have never been that way. Uh, uh, they have always been much more, it's, it's a bit of a hybrid, but they've always been much more a pay-as-you-go system. Today's taxpayers pay into the system, today's retirees draw benefits from the system. Uh, so the ratio of taxpayers uh, to retirees becomes very important. And any new program, uh, when we started, there were literally more than 100 taxpayers to retirees because but by the time the, the program matured by about 1960, we had a ratio of about five workers per uh, beneficiary. <coughs> Today, we're down to just under three. And again, by the time this whole pig and a python generation leaves the workforce and starts drawing on these programs, we will be down to two. And at that point, the math simply doesn't work. And every year, uh, there, is, there, are, there, are, there are trustees of the system who are appointed, they're nonpartisan, uh, and they, they make a report every year to the president, to Congress, to the American public, and they say, hey guys, we're, we're on an unsustainable path here, and it just doesn't work. And the longer you wait to fix them, and we know there's a huge policy debate about how to fix them, uh, but the longer you wait, 
the more the burden of any solution you choose will fall on today's young and, and tomorrow's beneficiaries. They will be the people getting screwed by this. The tragedy there is that when Social Security was created 80 years ago, the older folks were by far the poorest Americans, and that's another reason uh, they, were so, uh, they were so welcome and have enjoyed so much support. So today, even though we don't think of Social Security as an anti-poverty program, it is far and away our most muscular anti-poverty program. And without Social Security and Medicare, more than half of our seniors would be poor. Because of Social Security and Medicare, according to the official number, 10% of our seniors are poor. They've gone from being our poorest cohort to being our most financially secure. That doesn't mean people are living in luxury in their old age, but it does mean that this social safety net has done a magnificent job and it has worked. Uh, the question is, will it work for tomorrow? And here's my last slide, which is when we ask millennials, and, and that's the generation of young adults who are having such a hard time getting started in what has been for them a very hostile economy, and we know all the stories about not being able to get started and still living in your parents' home and, and, and all the rest. Uh, today's young are now the poorest cohort in society, and their children. There was an article just the other day, now one half of, of all children in K through 12 across the country qualify for free or reduced lunch. And when we ask millennials, uh, do you think Social Security will be there for you when you're ready to retire, we gave people three options. Uh, uh, yes, at full benefits, uh, yes, but at reduced benefits, or, or nothing at all. So 50% say it's not gonna be there at all for me. Another 40% say yes, but at reduced benefits, just 6% think of the, that the program will be there for them at the same level as they have been for their parents or grandparents. You would think that this would be uh, uh, you know, a go to say, wait a minute, let's, let's do something about this. Uh, I think in some ways the fact that it hasn't yet, it may be that uh, millennials haven't fully matured into the system, but it also is, I think, again, a testament to the extraordinary success of these programs. These kids, you know, when you ask older adults, have Medicare and Social Security been good for America, 90% say yes. And when you ask younger adults, the same question, 90% say yes, because they know what it has done for their parents and their grandparents, and the fact that it has created the social safety net sort of works its way through the family and helps everybody. So I think the challenge uh, for this group, the, the broader challenge for the folks who work a couple of blocks from here, is uh, th see this as an urgent challenge. These are precious and enormously successful uh, programs but if you wait too long to try to fix them, the hole gets deeper and the solution and the burden falls on these kids. I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much. And before, before I call uh, Brian up to the podium, I do wanna tell folks that there will be some time for questions at the end, but we will be taking them in writing. So there are pieces of paper on each of the tables and pens so as you listen to these great presentations, write down your questions and there will be people collecting them for later. Thanks. Ryan. Okay, thank you very much, Sensi. Thank you, Ron. As always, this Families USA conference has been absolutely fabulous and what I appreciate the most is that equity issues are front and center throughout all the programming on, in this conference. So I wanna thank the entire staff and Ron in particular. Uh, Paul, did you steal the clicker? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my, uh, as Sensi mentioned, my organization, the National Collaborative for Health Equity, is a new organization, but we have a relatively long history in that we emerged from the former Health Policy Institute of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. So we've been doing quite a bit of work on health equity issues uh, for many years, and, and my message this morning is simple, and that is that our fates are intertwined. The, the fate of the growing uh, older population uh, and the fate of our younger, uh, increasingly browner population, uh, we very much share a destiny. And, and as I, I love uh, the, the triangle that, that morphed into a rectangle, uh, young people of color are very much the foundation of that rectangle in many ways, as I hope to illustrate here. All right, first, a bit about health inequities. All of you know this, that many people of color suffer from poor health literally across the life cycle. At the beginning of the life cycle, at birth, with poor birth outcomes, uh, higher rates of, of infant mortality, low birth weight, all the way through childhood and adolescence in the form of, of higher rates of chronic and infectious diseases, through adulthood, higher rates of disability, disease, and then shortened lifespans at the end of the life cycle. And these inequities persist 
even when income and, and education are adjusted, as I'll illustrate shortly. And when we talk about the health of new arrivals in this population, many of you know uh, that many new arrivals are, in fact, healthier than their peers at comparable socioeconomic levels. But the longer they stay in the United States, the poorer their health tends to get. And succeeding generations, their health tends to get poorer over generations as well. These inequities have their roots in historic and contemporary forces such as discrimination, segregation, and poverty concentration, a point I'll return to shortly. Here's a simple illustration, an example of why both race and class matter. Many of you know this. These are rates of infant mortality uh, for mothers of different racial and ethnic groups and different education levels. And as you can see, for each racial and ethnic group, uh, as education increases, infant mortality rates go down. Uh, but it, this is not uh, a protective factor necessarily for people of color. So African American women with a college degree have higher rates of infant mortality than white women with less than a high school diploma. So it shows that both race and class matter. Why is this important for all of us? Our fates are intertwined for many reasons. We know that the health uh, status of our nation increasingly is being defined by the health status of, of people of color. Uh, we, we have uh, good reason to believe that our international competitiveness, our ability to pull out of the economic uh, downturn, all of this depends on the health, well-being, and productivity of all our communities, particularly communities of color. But there's also an economic burden associated with health inequalities, as uh, this study that we released at the Joint Center in 2009 illustrates. We did a study to estimate the economic burden associated with health inequalities. Of course, there are direct uh, health, uh, medical costs associated with health inequalities. That higher burden of disease and disability means that we are spending more as a nation for health care than we could if all populations enjoyed the same uh, opportunities for good health. But there are also indirect costs associated with health, health inequalities to the extent that people are too sick to work. Uh, they lose wages. Businesses lose productivity. And when people die prior to their productive years of life are over, uh, that we lose tax revenue at local, state, and federal levels. Well, what does this uh, total tab amount to? Between 2003 and 2000, 2006, over 30% of the direct health care costs for African Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinos were excess costs due to that higher burden of disease and disability. Eliminating those health inequities would have saved us about $230 million, billion dollars, I'm sorry, in that four-year period. And then when we add up those other indirect costs, lost wages and productivity, lost tax revenue, our total tab amounts to $1.24 trillion in that four-year period. And of course, that's a cost that all of us incur. So just a few definitions. When we talk about health inequities, we're referring to health differences that are rooted in social disadvantage and are therefore unjust or avoidable. There are many population groups that experience these inequities, again, because of both historic and contemporary inequality. So it's true, of course, for racial and ethnic groups, but also true for many religious minorities, of course, for people in lower socioeconomic tiers, people in rural areas, and so forth. And we need to correct these inequities because they are unjust and can be uh, avoided. Lately, many more of us are talking about health equity, a very aspirational term, assuring the conditions for optimal health for all people. And I love Kamara Jones' definition of, of health equity when she emphasizes that achieving health equity requires valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and correcting historical injustices, something that we have not done very well in the United States, and providing resources according to need. Health and healthcare disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. But importantly, Kamara adds, health equity is a process, not an outcome. It's the process of ongoing monitoring and correction of inequities that occur across many different dimensions of life. Importantly, equity and equality are not the same, right? As you can see in this picture here, the three boys on the left-hand side of the picture want to watch a baseball game. The little guy can't see it, though because he's standing on a box that doesn't allow him to see above the fence. Equity is assuring the conditions so that everybody can fully participate. So when the big kid gives his box to the little guy, all three of these boys can watch the baseball game. So when we're talking about equity, it's important not to conflate that with equality. So what are some areas that we can look to to begin to address inequities both in our health care systems as well as in the social and economic and environmental conditions that shape health. 
I've argued that there are at least three areas where we can begin to make progress now. And of course, all of us are deeply engaged in this struggle. I'll talk later uh, this morning about ways that we can all be engaged. Obviously, equity in healthcare delivery is important. Demographic change alone tells us that we need to prepare our healthcare systems for the growing diversity in the population, and we have to better align healthcare resources to match community need. Today, as a result of our market-driven healthcare system, there are many communities that don't have the healthcare infrastructure and resources necessary to address their needs. We can also work toward achieving equity in the healthcare workforce. Obviously, with our growing uh, older population, we need a well-trained workforce prepared to take care of them, as well as a workforce that can respond to the needs of an increasingly diverse population. So improving the diversity and the distribution of our healthcare workforce will better reflect uh, the population's needs. And finally, equity in community conditions for health. Reducing the concentration of health risks in communities of color while increasing access to health-enhancing resources is increasingly the focus of government agencies, private foundations, and many others who are striving to understand how can we help people be healthy in the first place. So first, equity in healthcare delivery, aligning resources with community need. We had a wonderful panel yesterday that explicitly uh, explored the many different policy levers that can incentivize uh, our healthcare systems to put more resources in communities where they're needed most. We know that people of color are disproportionately concentrated in health profession shortage areas and medically underserved areas. 28% of Latinos, 22% of African Americans report they have little to no choice in where they access care compared to only 15% of whites. About a third of Latinos, nearly a quarter of Ameri American Indians and Alaska Natives, and about 20% of African Americans and 15% of whites report having no regular source of health care, something that we, of course, hope will change as a result of the Affordable Care Act, but much more needs to be done. This is a map that's a little bit hard to see. This is New York City, and what we've done here is to map the density of primary care providers in relation to neighborhood level poverty. What we're looking at are zip, zip codes in New York City. The deeper the shade of green in the zip code, the deeper the poverty level. So those of you who know New York City know that in places like the South Bronx, uh, in uh, uh, central Brooklyn, uh, in, in Harlem and other areas, you have high concentrations of poverty. You also have a high concentration of people of color. The little round circle with the cross, which is hard to see, shows the density of providers. And where there is a larger circle, we see a higher density of primary care providers. And even though it's a little bit difficult to see on this map, if you were to study it closely, you'd see that there tends to be a higher concentration of primary care providers in more socioeconomically advantaged communities. Those are communities with the lighter green shade. The neighborhoods with the deeper green shade tend to have fewer primary care providers. Well, you might be thinking, well, it's New York City. Hop on, a, hop on the subway, hop on a bus, what's the issue here? Well, unfortunately, many of those communities uh, that have the lowest density of primary care providers have the highest rate of chronic disease and preventable conditions which could be uh, addressed and managed with good primary care. So what we're mapping here is the rate of ambulatory care sensitive conditions, it's a fancy term as many of you know, for the rate of chronic disease uh, that could be better managed and prevented in many cases with good primary care. So the darker green zip codes are neighborhoods with the highest density of ambul ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Uh, these are also the poorest neighborhoods. And again, they have the least uh, geographic access to primary care providers. And again, in a place like New York City, even with the fantastic public transportation infrastructure that's in place there, it remains difficult for low-income people, particularly if they're sick, to access primary care providers unless they're uh, geographically in those neighborhoods. So what can we do uh, to address these needs? We can expand health professions training programs. The, the panel that we had yesterday explored how successful the Title VII, the Title VIII health professions programs have been uh, and, and the, uh, the many ways in which those programs have improved the diversity and distribution of providers. But unfortunately, many health professions programs have been cut by Congress not understanding the need to incentivize providers to work in underserved communities. We know, for example, from HRSA, that the National Health Service Corps uh, is, is a critically important program, but there are nearly 9,000 vacancies in this program and nearly 17,000 practitioners are still needed to remove health profession shortage area designations around the country. We need to also continue the expansion of community health centers as the ACA authorizes. Again, 
Funding is critically important here to ensure that those health centers are located in communities where they are vitally needed. And finally, we need to continue to match Medicaid reimbursement with that of Medicare. Obviously, again, the ACA had a very important provision that elevated uh, Medicaid reimbursement to that of Medicare. We need to continue that policy to incentivize providers uh, to provide services to Medicaid populations, uh, something that some states are exploring, but we need to continue uh, that effort at the federal level. So equi equity in the healthcare workforce, promoting diversity and quality. The key here is to help people understand that diversity and quality are, are synonymous in this context. We know that healthcare providers of color are more likely to work in medically underserved communities. They reduce cultural and linguistic barriers to accessing care. Uh, and diversity in health professions training settings is associated with greater cultural competence among all trainees. Uh, the reality is that all of our providers, regardless of their race or ethnicity, are going to be treating uh, patients across racial, ethnic, cultural, and linguistic lines. All of them need to be better prepared to manage diversity in their clinical practice. Minority providers uh, tend to display better care process measures. We know as a, as a result of the work of people like Lisa Cooper Patrick and others uh, that, that providers of color show better uh, communicative uh, behavior. They're less likely to interrupt their patients when the patients are describing their presenting symptoms uh, to the doctor and there are other signs that their communication is better. So clearly all of our providers can learn from those kinds of communication skills. But these providers remain dramatically underrepresented among physicians, dentists, behavioral health professionals, and many other disciplines. Uh, one of the uh, studies that the Institute of Medicine released uh, in 2004, and since you mentioned this study, a very important report released about 10 years ago called In the Nation's Compelling Interest, uh, where a study committee looked at what can be done uh, beyond federal and state policies? What can be done in health professions training institutions uh, to, to begin to encourage greater diversity in the health professions? There are a number of recommendations that came uh, from this report, including recommendations that our health professions training institutions, our medical schools, our nursing schools, our dental, dental schools, should adapt mission statements that clearly address the value of diversity, that encourage a comprehensive re review of applicants' files in the application process, de-emphasizing standardized test data in the admissions uh, equation, including representatives from groups affected by the institution's admissions decisions on the admissions committee to help select our future health professionals, to push for diversity in accreditation standards, again, providing appropriate carrots and sticks so that our health professions training institutions can do a better job to, to embrace diversity among students and faculty, and to develop and regularly evaluate comprehensive strategies for improving the institutional climate for diversity. And finally, a critically important uh, area that we know is important, uh, and that is to remove financial barriers for students of color to participate, and all low-income students to participate in health professions training. We could make a very good argument that there are cost savings that we all can incur to the extent that we have providers that are committed to working in medically underserved areas. Those providers should not have to pay tuition to attain a medical degree or a nursing degree if they commit to working in those communities. Finally, let me talk about equity. Thank you. Finally, let me talk about equity in community conditions for health. Again, critically important if we, we, if we want to improve opportunities for good health among all populations. We know that highly segregated communities of color tend to host a high concentration of environmental health risks, such as polluting industries. We know, for example, uh, from the work of the United Church of Christ, uh, their very important study released in, in, in 2008 found a heavy concentration of polluting industries in communities of color. Some 56% uh, of uh, commercial hazardous waste facilities are in, located in communities of color, even though they only constitute about 37% of the population. Many communities of color that are highly segregated are also food deserts, lacking geographic and financial access to healthy foods, while in contrast, hosting a heavy concentration of vendors selling unhealthy products, disproportionate alcohol and tobacco advertising and sales, fast food stores, convenience stores, carry out stores, literally some of these communities, there are very, very few nutritious food options within those communities. Uh, and so many of these communities, uh, you see kids growing up on uh, high, sh high sugar, high sodium foods that are clearly unhealthful and increased risk for childhood obesity. 
Many of these communities lack access to safe spaces for exercise or recreation. So we've done a good job of wagging our fingers at folks, saying you need to eat better, you need to exercise, but that's more than a notion in communities of color where community conditions literally do not support those healthy behaviors. Many of these communities have, have lower access to means for economic mobility, such as good schools, access to capital to start a business, uh, and high poverty levels that uh, depreciate home values. Uh, and when we think about the value uh, of our homes, that's the, the major source of wealth for most American families, segregation constrains wealth in communities of color that are highly segregated because those homes don't appreciate in value at the same rate as identical properties in majority white communities. We know that people in highly segregated communities pay more for the same goods and services as people in more advantaged communities, and they suffer from higher levels of stress as a result of all of these kinds of neighborhood conditions uh, that negatively affect health. We know that people of color, African Americans, Latinos, American Indians are over-concentrated in high poverty tracts. Uh, we released a study in 2010 uh, looking at decennial census data, about 90% of white Americans in our major metro areas live in areas with low levels of poverty concentration, between zero and 20%, as you can see uh, from the bar on the far left. But only about 55% of African Americans live in those neighborhoods with low levels of poverty concentration. And similarly, Asian Americans, Latinos, American Indians are overrepresented in the high poverty census tracts. Now, you might argue, isn't that to be expected given differences in income and wealth? Well, we can control for that just by looking at families below the poverty level. Poor African-American, white, and Latino families live in dramatically different neighborhoods in our, in our major uh, metro areas. As you can see from this slide, about 70% of poor white Americans live in neighborhoods with low to moderate levels of poverty concentration, between zero and 20%. In contrast, only about a third of poor African Americans and only about 40% of poor Latinos live in those very neighborhoods that are much more conducive to good health. In contrast, they're much more concentrated in medium and high poverty census tracts. This is dramatically illustrated in a city like Detroit. Now, I'm a native of Detroit, so I'm gonna pick on Detroit a little bit. I hope, uh, hope no one here is offended. Uh, but Detroit, Detroit is a dramatic example of both race and class segregation. As you can see from this slide, in Metro Detroit, about 95% of white children in Metro Detroit live in neighborhoods with between zero and 20% poverty concentration. Only about 40% of African American kids and 60% of Latino kids in Metro Detroit live in those neighborhoods, but over half of African American kids in Detroit are concentrated in census tracts with between 20 and 40% poverty concentration. These are the very neighborhoods that put these kids at risk for a poor trajectory for health across the life cycle. Again, we can control for these differences just by looking at families below the poverty level in Metro Detroit. So we're looking at poor African American, Latino, white, and Asian Pacific Islander families. What we find again is that poor white children are much more advantaged relative to their similarly poor uh, uh, kids of color. About 75% of poor white children in Metro Detroit live in neighborhoods with low levels of poverty concentration. Only about a fifth of poor African American kids and about a third of poor Latino kids live in those neighborhoods. In contrast, they're much more likely to be found in neighborhoods with high levels of poverty concentration. This is but one example of why we should never conflate race and class. Both are operative here, but on average, the experience of poverty is much different for white children than it is for our kids of color. So how do we address this? We argue for both place-based investments as well as people-based investments, and we argue that they should happen simultaneously. Place-based investments include efforts to reduce the concentration of community-level health risk while increasing geographic access to health-enhancing resources. People-based investments, on the other hand, are investments in people through individual and family interventions designed to improve access to opportunity and maximize the ability to harness opportunities. So place-based investments, many of you are, are aware of many important efforts going on around the country. Fresh food financing initiatives, incentivizing grocers to come into food deserts, to set up shop. Often these grocers find that they achieve a so-called triple bottom line not only are they a good source of nutritious foods for the community, but they're a good source of jobs and they can turn a profit. Land use and zoning policies to reduce the concentration of health risk. The County Council of Los Angeles, for example, imposed a moratorium on the establishment of new fast food restaurants in South Central LA, a community that very much like Detroit is overrun 
with fast food and, and convenience stores and carry out stores. They are now exploring incentives for grocery stores and sit down restaurants to come into those communities. Joint use agreements, for example, with schools to increase access to parks and green space and playgrounds to ensure that the community has a space for active living. Uh, health impact assessments to help policymakers understand the consequences of policy decisions in non-health areas such as education, transportation, and housing. Housing mobility, uh, including uh, the, move, uh, the Moving to Opportunity uh, study, which I'll say more about shortly, to help people to move into higher opportunity neighborhoods and early childhood educational investments, uh, which have been shown to improve both the edu educational attainment and health status of children who are at risk. And these benefits accrue and show uh, tremendous benefits across the life cycle for these young people. Let me conclude with a quote that I like from the World Health Organization. Many of you are familiar with their very important report uh, from their Commission on the Social Determinants of Health in 2008. They wrote that inequities in health and avoidable health inequalities arise because of the circumstances in which people grow, live, work, and age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness. The conditions in which people live and die are in turn shaped by political, social, and economic forces. The, the fact is that we have come to this place, we have come to the point where we continue to live in separate and unequal communities as a result of policies and practices that have been put into place, not the voluntary behavior of individuals. So in the same fashion, we can undo these inequities and, and improve opportunities for good health for all. Now finally, if you get ticked off about this, as I do, then you wanna do something about it. And I wanna encourage those of you who wanna roll up your sleeves and get engaged with us to join this network, the Health Equity Leadership and Exchange Network, uh, started by my colleague and friend, Daniel Dawes from the Morehouse School of Medicine. The Health Equity Leadership and Exchange Network, or HELEN, provides a space for those of us working in health equity to share information and strategies, to connect with each other across jurisdictions. Uh, we are providing uh, policy analysis, ways to communicate and, and, and form partnerships and coalitions. So this is a rich opportunity uh, for us to begin to come together and form the kinds of partnerships necessary to advance health equity movements, community by community, state by state, and here at the federal level as well. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. collecting questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, let me thank both of you so much for providing this very important foundation for all of our understanding on the issues that we have to grapple with coming, moving forward as our nation changes and, and helping us frame how we need to intervene to make sure that those systems that deal with illness, as the World Health Organization described it, are better suited to be able to address these populations. So our first, our first question from the audience is, what is the contribution of cultural, including dietary traditions, to the inequities, I assume? Sure, so obviously uh, we, we enjoy a rich mosaic of many different population groups, increasingly so as a result of immigration. So uh, many population groups have traditional cultural patterns of diet. Uh, and so certainly, in many cases, we are, have reason to be concerned about practices that do not, uh, are, that are not conducive to good health. I would argue uh, that in many instances, the kinds of traditional uh, diets and cultural practices that we, uh, that our populations have enjoyed uh, going back centuries have been unfortunately co-opted uh, by market forces uh, which encourage unhealthy diets. So for example, when I mentioned food deserts, uh, the fact that people don't have a choice uh, about where to get their nutritious uh, foods uh, can sometimes lead to habits uh, that are hard to undo. So if you live in a place like Detroit, again, where for many years uh, it was hard to find a grocery store in the city limits of Detroit. Uh, so for generations, sometimes people have turned to unhealthy sources of food, uh, fast food carryout stores, which can undo 
more healthful traditional practices. And so those are the kinds of cultural trends that, that worry me. Uh, again, I think historically, many population groups uh, have turned to dietary practices and, and cultural traditions uh, that have been healthful and important to maintain uh, a, a healthy population. But in, in many cases, those uh, trends and those uh, traditional practices have been undone, uh, unfortunately, by heavy marketing, particularly to kids, of unhealthy products. So uh, we need to find ways to return to some of those practices uh, and ensure <coughs> that we can re remain true to cultural traditions while encouraging a healthier uh, diet. Because in fact, there is plenty of research that recent immigrants actually, because they're you, you're keeping their traditional diets, have a protective factor. And as they assimilate and start following more of the um, traditional American or common American diets, that, that's when we see their health, their health reduce, correct? It's a lot of speculation that that may be one of the reasons why the health status of new arrivals tends to get worse over time and of course across generations because they do adapt to, to, to U.S. practices which may not be healthful. Our next question is, some states and local governments are exploring sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. What are your thoughts on such a policy tax and its impact on minority communities and people living in poverty? That's an excellent question. So the city of Berkeley uh, just passed a sugar-sweetened beverage tax. A lot of other jurisdictions are looking at this, facing powerful pushback from, in many cases, uh, manufacturers. I'll be curious to see, I'd love to see the data from Berkeley uh, as this unfolds. Uh, we know uh, that it, with tobacco, for example, that those taxes tended to reduce uh, tobacco use because they just literally got too expensive for, for people to uh, uh, purchase tobacco products. So there may be reason to believe that similar tactics uh, may work. Uh, but again, we need more comprehensive strategies. It's not just about a tax policy, I believe, uh, but also about other strategies to improve access to better nutritional options. This is true also in the beverage industry. This is a good one. It's about data, which we like, right, Brian? In the past, data collection was a problem because many clinical databases did not capture race or ethnicity. Has that problem been successfully addressed, or is policy advocacy still needed? That's a great question. So um, the collection of race and ethnicity data is critically important, and we need to educate both consumers and researchers about why. Uh, we know, for example, as you pointed out, that people of color are, tend to be underrepresented in clinical trials, uh, so we don't have rich data on the effectiveness of interventions across populations. Uh, but, but it's also true that researchers, in many cases, have not been explicit about why race or ethnicity is important. They have left it unexplained, which tends to reinforce the notion that there's something biological or genetic in population differences that these researchers are studying. We know from the geneticists that we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA and that it is impossible to tell one's race or ethnicity uh, based on their DNA. In fact, there's more genetic variability within so-called racial and ethnic groups than between them. We gotta be much more explicit about why race matters. And I've argued elsewhere that race matters because of the kinds of things that I was talking about. Different environmental exposures, differences in the way people are treated on the basis of race or ethnicity, uh, differences in, in, in sometimes in cultural practices. These are the reasons why race is important, and we need to be clear about why that is and do a better job of collecting that data. If I could just <clears throat> weigh in on that, how we categorize people, as I suggested in my presentation, is a challenge not just for the culture, it is a specific challenge for the Census Bureau and has been since 19, 1790 when we did our first census. If you look decade after decade, the Census Bureau revises the way it counts people based on this, this complicating factor that yes, there is a genetic, but there's mostly a social construct around race. If you go back to the 19th and early 20th centuries, census takers had instructions uh, words like quadroon and octoroon, the one drop rule, if you will, was absolutely written into the instructions for census takers. Today, uh, and, and it changes every year, a hundred years ago, Indian Americans from India were, were uh, one census were white, the next census were, were, were Asian. We, go, we have gone back and forth. This is a very fluid process, including right now. Uh, and the fluidity right now has to do with the Hispanic designation. This is our biggest and fastest growing minority group. It is the only group in our history that we, the Census Bureau, and, and this was by act of Congress, has de determined is an ethnicity rather than a race. And it, and it did so in response to uh, 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 some 
uh, some of the activism coming out of the, uh, the civil rights movement uh, back in the 60s and 70s. It's been a very confusing de uh, designation, however, for Hispanics. Because <clears throat> now the Census Bureau asks you two questions on this. The first question is, are you Hispanic or not? Uh, and Hispanics say, yes, that's how we get a count of how many Hispanics there are. Uh, then the next question is, well, what race are you? And you are, uh, are you white, are you black, are you Asian American, are you Native American? There's no Hispa Hispanicity in that second one. A lot of Hispanics say, well, wait a minute, I just told you who I am, I'm Hispanic. And they don't know how to answer the second question. So there are about 20 million Americans who check some other race because they can't find themselves on the racial question. 19 and a half million of those 20 million are Hispanics. So the Census Bureau uh, doesn't like when it has categories that don't seem to comport to people's understanding of who they are. They're in the midst of trying to figure out whether they need to change the wording of these two questions. And I would suggest that you know, the, the glass half full in me says, look, these are actually good problems to have because they do suggest the reality uh, that Brian alluded to, is these are not hardwired genetic distinctions. These are social constructs, and social constructs change over time as attitudes and behaviors change. And you know, as a Hispanic, I can say that there's also a lot of people who say, you know, we know that their Hispanics are not a monolith, and they are Hispanics of all races. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's that tension with how do we make things simple for people to answer, but also how do we make the questions represent the reality of what the Spanish, what the Latino races in Puerto Rico, I mean, in, in, in the US, for example, what they actually are. And it's very interesting when you look from, from country to country, what people, what Hispanics consider white versus African American varies very, very greatly, depending on whether you're in Puerto Rico, in Brazil, or in other countries. Um, one thing that I do want to add, though, about the data, I think it's really important if we're looking at health equity more broadly than just race and ethnicity, one of the challenges that people that were advocacy still is needed, and we've had conversations about this in workshops, is to make sure that there is also healthcare data uh, about other categories. Particularly right now, we're, we're in a big discussion with HHS about including LGBTQ uh, categories as well when we're capturing healthcare information. Um, so I'm, I'm told that we have only time for one more question. Um, Many states are spreading patient-centered medical homes and other enhanced primary care to improve health and lower costs. What are the best strategies or resources for identifying best strategies for using patient care medical homes to reduce racial and ethnic disparities? Yeah, great question. So uh, obviously we've explored a lot of different uh, models of care delivery. Uh, I, I go back to the community health centers and the kinds of models that they approach where deep engagement with communities, having boards that guide uh, the policies and practices of these health centers. Uh, over 50% of these uh, health centers have to have communities on, on the boards. Uh, community health centers, in, in my view, have done a remarkable job of providing high quality care, in many cases under very difficult circumstances. So, you know, uh, those of us that have been in the field long enough see the different changes, managed care, accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes. I, I don't know the data specifically as it relates to people of color. I think we'll see that coming out shortly. But efforts to improve quality and access uh, need to build on what we already know. And the community health centers, in many cases, have done it right in terms of addressing the needs of these populations. So we have the answers. Uh, we don't have to change the names necessarily uh, in ways uh, as we struggle to figure out what are the most cost-efficient ways to deliver high-quality care for every population. Great. We have one more? Okay. Um, what is the likelihood of the medical physician gatekeepers to change the requirements to allow foreign immigrant physicians to obtain licenses to practice in the U.S.? This is a very specific question, Brian, so hopefully you have something to answer. Particularly, they want to know about the adult physicians who need more resources and support for maintaining their families while they return to school to be able to be licensed in the United States. Yes, so the impact of uh, foreign uh, medical graduates, for example, here in the U.S., and then the second part of the question was about... Especially considering that many of them have to go back and study more to be able to get the licensing, and how do they then maintain their families, because they're yep. already, you know, in that stage of life. Exactly. You, you know, it's, it's a very interesting challenge, because in many cases, foreign medical graduates and, and graduates of other health professions, uh, training institutions, have filled uh, important needs here in the United States. We know that they reduce cultural and, li and linguistic barriers. 
uh, they are more likely to work in underserved communities. Uh, and so that's been critically important, again, in this effort to improve the diversity and distribution of the population. Uh, we need to be uh, worried about addressing the many hurdles that they may experience to continuing their training, be they, be they financial, be they uh, addressing family and childcare needs, uh, those kinds of issues. Uh, and so we need to be taking into account those needs uh, in our policies, but I also worry about the brain drain from other uh, countries where these providers are coming from because they too need those providers. Uh, I would encourage uh, uh, a, a multi-pronged effort where we're also uh, very focused on lifting up the uh, homegrown talent of young people of color uh, native to the U.S., African American, Latino, uh, American Indian, many other uh, populations of young people. Again, increasingly, they are the workforce in this in this country. Uh, so we've got to ensure uh, that they have the appropriate opportunities to achieve a uh, training in a health professions career, so that they can go out and serve their communities as well. Thank you very much. Please let's thank um, our speakers. Thank you, thank you all so much. We're now going to our workshops. Um, the workshops, most will be held on this level, except for two, issues in prescription drug coverage and state initiatives that push the envelope. Those two workshops, you'll have to go through the lobby and then up to the second floor for the meeting rooms for those. But we'll do our workshops now, return back here for our closing luncheon, which will be at 1245. Thanks. Mm -hmm.